Okay. So let me, uh, uh, for a second here. I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so I would like to thank everybody uh, once again to come uh, to the online Spice Spin Plus X uh, seminar series organized by the Spin Phenomena and the Disciplinary Center and the Collaborative Center Spin Plus X between Casa Lato and Mines. Uh, Spice being led by myself, Tiger Sinova and Karen Abishwa City. And uh, the Spin Plus X consortium uh, being led by Martin Ashim and uh, Borja Hillebrand in Kaiserslautern. And, and Matthias Chloe, which happens to be today's speaker um, in, uh, in here in Mines. Uh, with this, let me just give a very brief introduction to Matthias. Uh, he's very well known in our field. Uh, had a, a huge impact in the dynamics of domain walls for, uh, at the beginning of his career. But now he kind of attacks everything from uh, uh, from a different magnetic spintronics to pathological phases of matter, all related to magnetism. Uh, he got his PhD in 2003, he's quite young, uh, and uh, joined uh, as a full professor in mines about seven or eight years ago. And uh, his interests are in magnetism, magnetics, spintronics. Um, he has several, many awards, uh, founding member of the Global Young Academy of, uh, of uh, Gutenberg uh, Collegium, uh, Nicholas Kurti Prize. And this year, he's actually a distinguished lecturer on the IWCW uh, um, uh, Association and uh, Magnetic, Magnetic Association. But, uh, and this is what, what he'll, he'll be sharing to that, this uh, distinguished lecture that he's given on all over the place. Uh, so with this, I'll stop sharing now. Um, and I'm going to record in cloud. And um, please go ahead, Matthias, and um, start whenever you want. Okay, so uh, firstly, you can see my screen and you can hear me? Not yet. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so everything's good. Okay, great. So then, okay, yeah, firstly, welcome everyone. It's uh, my great pleasure to give this presentation um, on uh, reading, writing, and transporting spin in antiferromagnets. And uh, maybe the first thing I should really do is, apart from switching off the air condition, is um, to actually thank Jairo for putting together this series, because even though he is always very kind in mentioning uh, myself also as one of the co-organizers, but one should uh, give all the credit to Jairo for the actual organization. So this is really, really, really good. And I'm very happy and I think people also in the community really appreciate this conference series or this, this uh, talk series. Um, yes, and so um, I'm going to try, to try today to give you a little bit of an introductory view on different aspects of how to make antiferromagnets possibly useful. And that implies in particular the key uh, uh, processes that are necessary to make antiferromagnets useful or use them. And that includes in particular uh, the reading of um, antiferromagnetic systems, uh, the writing of antiferromagnetic systems, so the information uh, storage, as well as the long distance transport of spin information in antiferromagnets. And as Hiro pointed out, uh, I'm this year's um, IEEE uh, Distinguished Lecturer. And so this means that usually I should be traveling around the world giving talks in a lot of places, but instead I'm sitting at home giving talks at home or at my university uh, in various places, which uh, definitely is good for my CO2 footprint and also the family appreciates it, while of course it does not help all the interactions that I would have liked to find. But I'd like to show this slide because I'd like to promote a little bit the IEEE Magnetic Society. The IEEE Magnetic Society Society is the largest learned society for magnetism in the world, and it organizes uh, key um, uh, workshops and conferences, uh, such as the Intermac conference. Um, it has a newsletter, it has a mailing list, it also has very useful uh, job advertisements for people working in magnetism. It organizes a summer school, which I can highly recommend that you put forward your application for it. It's free, it's funded by the IEEE Magnetic Society. It has a nice outreach video, so if ever you need to show to your, say, colleagues from non-magnetic background or even the general public why magnetism is useful. This is quite a nice video. It publishes key journals such as the IEEE Magnetics Letters and IEEE Transactions on Magnetics. And it holds this distinguished lecture series. And this year, the four people chosen are Masashi Shiraishi, Tim Mewes, Brad Koopmans, and myself. And finally, just a quick advertisement for next week. Um, actually, the... Um, 
IEEE Magnetic Society uh, young researchers organize a 24 hour around the clock around the globe conference with 24 hours of talks that's next Thursday 27th of August here's the website IEEE magnetics.org or here's a longer one if you want to jot this down um, I can highly recommend to participate and listen to 24 hours or at least part of that um, uh, of talks in that area of research Okay, good. So let's start with the topic. So why antiferromagnets? Well, some of you might recognize this guy here. So this is Louis Niel, who said in his uh, Nobel lecture in 1970 that antiferromagnets are interesting but useless. And so um, while of course I would never argue with a Nobel laureate, what I would like to show to you today is why they are possibly less useless than Niel originally thought. So let me introduce uh, to you why possibly antiferromagnets have advantages over ferromagnets. And there are a number of advantages, and one that is relatively easy to understand is that if you compare ferromagnets and antiferromagnets, in ferromagnets where you have a net moment, you generate a stray field. And this means this bit here, which is in a memory stuck between two other bits, has um, an energy that is different from this bit here because the stray field interaction of these three bits here leads to this bit being in a favorable alignment, whereas this bit here will be in an unfavorable alignment. And so the switching will be different between these two. And also you cannot bring the bits arbitrarily close to one another because the stray field coupling would then lead to disturbing the writing. In antiferromagn, oh yeah, anti information here is stored in 180 degree different orientation. So here the magnetization is pointing to the right, that's a logic one, and here the magnetization is pointing to the left, that's a logic zero. Now, in an antiferromagnet, this is a bit different. In an antiferromagnet, as you can see here, the uh, uh, magnetization of the antiferromagnetic um, sublattices can be oriented either up, down, or left, right, while the difference between right, left, and left, right is actually not something that we are using because you cannot, in most antiferromagnets, distinguish between the two sublattices. So here the information is stored in the difference between the two sublattices is pointing left, right, or up, down. So there's a 90 degree reorientation that is the writing process. But then since there is no net stray field, this means potentially you can get more than 100 times higher packing density as shown here. Um, what are other advantages of antiferromagnets? So um, other advantages are that the magnetic susceptibility is for antiferromagnets uh, of the order of 10 to the five times smaller than in ferromagnets. And that is because um, antiferromagnets have this no net moment um, because the total sublattices compensate, but um, you can still with a magnetic field slightly tilt the sublattices. So it's not an infinite difference, but there's a sizable difference. And if you look at the energy scale, so this is a slide which I got from Helen Gomonai, then the most important energy scale is the antiferromagnetic coupling between the two sublattices, the neighboring sublattices. And this is of the order of a thousand Tesla or so. So that's something which you can never break in the lab. The next bit um, uh, is the uh, um, exchange coupling within a sublattice. So here the red spin to the next red spin. And that is of the order of 100 Tesla. And uh, that sets the nail temperature. And that is already something which is more accessible, at least in high field labs. And finally, you have a possibility to change the antiferromagnetic orientation of both sublattices from one direction to, say, a 90 degree different direction. And this is set by the anisotropy. And the anisotropy can be relatively small. So this is actually something that might be accessible in the lab. So what you can see here is that <clears throat> the ex scientifically accessible energy scales in the lab is typically this lowest one here, so the anisotropy energy, whereas the switching of the two antiferromagnetic subletters into a parallel state is very unlikely or virtually impossible for most materials. Um, and this is what we're going to use later on, but generally uh, most uh, magnetic fields don't tend to change the um, sublattice orientation. So. Um, another advantage of antiferromagnets is the eigenfrequencies, which are in a, at a much higher frequency range uh, for antiferromagnets, which is of the order of terahertz, compared to ferromagnets, where it's of the order of gigahertz. Um, and that has to do with this anti-parallel sublattice coupling, which you see here for a typical eigenmode. 
Um, if you also look around how many of these materials are there, you actually see that there are a lot more antiferromagnets than ferromagnets. And that has to do with the fact that if you have a ferromagnet, then these ferromagnets, they have to couple parallel. So you cannot have a lot of different coupling mechanisms. You usually just have Heisenberg anti uh, ferromagnets where the spin-spin uh, coupling is parallel. Whereas with antiferromagnets, there are many different ways to couple spins antiferromagnetically. And let me just show you some example. So this is a slide from Mr. Ravindran at Oslo University. And there you can already see that in the simplest case, um, you can, for instance, have a layered antiferromagnet as shown here, the A type, where the spins in one layer point up and then here in the central layer point down and then in the second next layer, they point up again. But you can also have spins within one layer pointing in opposite direction as shown here for the C type where the central spin is say pointing down and then the two spins, uh, the spins at the edges are pointing up. And then this is the same in all the lattices or you can combine both where you have again the spin at the center pointing up, surrounding pointing down, but in the next layer, it is then the opposite, the so-called G type. And actually, these type of differently coupled antiferromagnets exist in reality. This is, for instance, nickel oxide, which is a layered antiferromagnet where the 111 planes have the um, uh, sublattices pointing in one direction, and uh, in the neighboring 111 plane, the, anti the spins of that plane point in the opposite direction. So you have a, a fully uncompensated layer, but all the layers compensate each other, and you cannot distinguish between the layers. Um, then here you have manganese to gold, which we're going to talk a bit about in the future. Manganese to gold is quite special because manganese to gold actually has um, sub lattices that you can distinguish. And this is very important as we'll find out later. And then you can go beyond these um, uh, so-called collinear antiferromagnets where the spins of the two subletters are pointing in opposite directions. And what you can do, you can go to non-collinear antiferromagnets as this famous manganese three tin, where you can see that even though the total magnetization of all the subletters taken together is zero, um, you see that they point within one of these plaquettes, they point in very different directions here, you have 60 degree different angles. And then you can make life ultimately complex if you not only have uh, non-collinear, but also non-coplanar, such as these magnetic 5, silicon 3 from our colleagues in Karlsruhe, where you can see that actually you have spins which are pointing in the plane. But you also, for instance, here, you have a spin actually which is pointing out of the plane towards you um, and you have spins which point away from you. So this is really a three-dimensional spin orientation where again in the unit cell, the net moment is zero, but the spin ordering and the coupling between the different spins is very, very complex. Now, this is far too difficult for me. And this is the reason that today in this talk, I'm just going to focus on these collinear antiferromagnets. So everything I showed to you today is collinear antiferromagnets, even though anti, uh, non-collinear and non-coplanar antiferromagnets are super exciting. Um, another difference is that mostly in ferromagnets and metallic ferromagnets, the medial elastic coupling tends to be relatively weak, whereas in antiferromagnets, which are often oxides, um, where the position of the oxygen atom influences strongly the coupling, also the medial elastic coupling tends to be strong. And that means that, uh, and, and as I said, um, in ferromagnets usually you have simple Heisenberg exchange, whereas in antiferromagnets, as I just showed you, you can have all these very complex orientations of the uh, um, of the magnetization, and therefore you have um, a relatively uh, well. You can have very different spin structures. Okay, and in terms of useful. Yes, so far, um, antiferromagnets are useful as passive elements. So we know that, for instance, we have in um, uh, hard, hard, hard disks, we have antiferromagnets as the um, pinning layers for um, spin valves, so this exchange bias. But as active elements, they have not been used so far because they're hard to measure and hard to control. And so my approach here is that I'll try to show you that they're definitely interesting for antiferromagnets, and they might possibly even be useful as active elements. And that's something which I think I want to try and convey to you in the next half an hour or so. Okay, so this was the introduction.
Um, now let's come to uh, the key slides. So if there's anything from my presentation that you should take, uh, take with you, then I'd like you to take this slide with you, where I hope that I can show you that ferromagnets rely on magnetic fields, which are generated by coils. So this is what I call 19th century physics. This physics was developed in the 19th century. Uh, whereas antiferromagnets, if you want to write them, for instance, by these staggered spin orbit talks, this is what I call 21st century physics. So uh, this is the key message if you just want to remember one slide. Okay, so let's start with the physics. So uh, first let me try to show you how we can read antiferromagnets. And I'll show you how we can image and electrically read out thin film, bulk, and 2D antiferromagnets. So one of the best well-known um, uh, approaches uh, to uh, read out antiferromagnets is X-ray magnetic linear dichroism. This is a very well-established technique. And this X-ray magnetic linear dichroism means that if you go to an absorption edge um, of, for instance, nickel in nickel oxide, then you get a linear dichroism, meaning that the absorption of linearly polarized light of that energy along this direction and this direction is different, parallel and perpendicular to the nail vector. So this is a typical um, uh, extra magnetic linear dichroism spectrum that you see here, and you can use that to do imaging. And then we see, for instance, at 296 Kelvin, so this was one of the first samples that we had, you see these relatively small domains, and there are many of these domains. Uh, if you then increase the temperature, then the uh, contrast goes down, and eventually at the DL temperature, the contrast vanishes. What you still see here is some um, uh, topographic contrast. Okay, so this allows you to do direct imaging, but the, diff the problem is that this can only be done at the synchrotron. Now, an alternative is electrical readout, and um, this is based on what is called spin hole magnetoresistance. So, spin hole magnetoresistance for insulating antiferromagnet is an effect where if you put a heavy metal uh, strip on top of an antiferromagnet, so here it's for instance platinum, and you push a current through the strip, then the uh, resistance of this um, platinum strip is different depending on whether the uh, um, uh, direction of the generated spin current in the platinum is parallel or has a perpendicular component to the nail vector, which I denote here as L. And uh, so um, if you have a component that is perpendicular, you can absorb spin. If you have only parallel components, you can't absorb spin. And therefore, you have a spin current coming back that contributes then to the um, uh, charge current by the uh, inverse spin hole effect and then changes the resistance of the platinum wire. So essentially what we can measure here is we can measure the uh, um, dot product between the nail vector and the spin or the square of the dot product. And then um, from that, we can deduce the direction of the nail vector. Um, so this was first done in ferromagnets by Nakayama. And then more recently, this was established also for antiferromagnets. There's a nice theory paper by Oner Monchon. And then Bart van Wees group here, the Hochebohm paper, and Sebastian Gönnwein's group and our group, we all measured that the nickel oxide. And then we found that if you then have, for instance, here a field that you can rotate along different planes with respect to the nickel oxide easy plane, uh, then you can orient um, the uh, nail vector, and I'll show you later why, and you can see a change in the resistance, which then actually leads to this sine squared dependence of the uh, sine squared dependence of the um, uh, longitudinal and transverse resistance. And you see that if you go from small fields to large fields, the amplitude of the signal gets larger because at 11 Tesla, we can rotate more of the nail vector than at one Tesla. And you can actually plot this and uh, see there's a nice fit to a theory which was uh, developed by Helen Gomonai explaining this. So SMR allows us to actually detect the direction of the nail vector in the insulating antiferromagnet. So now if you have a metallic antiferromagnet, then you can actually use a different effect. So a metallic antiferromagnet such as manganese to gold, we can firstly also do XMLD PIM imaging, um, where we see here that we have as grown uh, domains, random domains, where the nail vector is either pointing up or down, this is this light gray, or it's pointing left and right, which is the dark gray. And um, Okay, and oh, wow. So now, 
PowerPoint stopped. PowerPoint stopped, okay. Yeah, I Not a problem. Are we why. Let me just, I'll just restart it. Not a problem. Okay. Otherwise, a live lecture. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Always exciting things happening. So let me just All restart right. where I just was. Okay, here we go. Um, da -da 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 so, yes. Okay, and share my screen. And so, I just need to get, get to the right. Yes, here we are. Okay, okay I'm just going to share my screen and see if it goes back to the same where we were before. Okay. Uh, no, it didn't go back to that one, so I'm going to move this to the other. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, but now I, I show. I, I show. I showed the. I showed the wrong. I have to switch the the presenter and the. I'll do that. I'll switch the presenter and the. Yeah. No. No. You still the presenter. You need to. Yes, I do that. Just okay. Oh, okay. So. Come back. Yeah. 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 So I'll just go to the right slide. Um. Okay, here we are. Okay, good. So uh, we have this uh, multi-domain state where we see um, domains with different orientations. Um, and we can actually then also go to a state where we apply after applying a strong field and get a more or less aligned magnetization state. And now we can measure AMR. So AMR is interesting because, again, it allows us to deduce um, the direction of the nail vector because there's a difference in the resistance for the case that the current is flowing perpendicular to the nail vector or the current that is flowing along the nail vector. So this is actually recently published here is primarily the work of the group of Martin Jordan that's working with me. Um, and um, we did this by applying a very strong field of like 60 Tesla to reorient the nail vector. Um, and what is interesting is you now you can even do time resolved measurements where, oh, let me, yeah, where uh, we can see that, um, let me just see if I can go to the laser pointer again. Okay, here we go. Okay, you see the laser pointer again? Okay. Um, so where we see that if we apply a field, we can measure during the application of the field pulse. And we can actually see that um, the resistance firstly goes generally up. And there's a typical ordinary magnet resistance effect. So there's nothing particularly magnetic about it. That's something that all the materials do. Um, but um, you can also see that then above this field, roughly here, um, we see um, a change uh, that is hysteretic of the uh, resistance. And that is uh, assigned due to a change of the um, nail vector orientation. Um, so that's this area here. Um, and now the question is, if we now go back to zero, it turns out that initially the resistance change is much larger, it's like 0.75%. But before we saw that the AMR is only 0.125%. So the question is, where does this difference come from? And so it turns out that if you wait for a few seconds, there is a large part of the resistance that is recovering to this 0.125% value, meaning that initially we have a larger change of the resistance, but after you know a few minutes or so, we are back at this 0.15%, which is the AMR. And if you go back to the slide where I showed you the domain structure, you could see that after the application of a field, we still had a lot of domain walls. So the interpretation here is that here, after directly after applying the field, we have no more domain walls. We have a fully aligned state. Um, and then uh, later here, we have the formation of domain walls so that um, you actually have a domain wall meter resistance that gives you this 0.75% and the pure AMR is the 0.15%. So this is something that we are still working on. I think it's quite interesting because it allows you to read out the state of metallic antiferromagnets. Um, then just a few words on layered antiferromagnets is something which you recently started to work on, which I think is very exciting. There's lots of uh, um, lots of literature out there. And for instance, these um, trihalides, such as the chromium chloride, is a very exciting material because it's a layered antiferromagnet, which for one layer is a pure ferromagnet. For two layers, it's a pure antiferromagnet because you have fully compensated. 
And then for three layers, it's again, uh, you have one layer, which is, which is an at moment. So you can make this, you can switch between ferromagnet and antiferromagnet by changing the number of layers. And we recently went to a more complex antiferromagnet, this chromium thiophosphate, and we measured some angular linked resistance response, uh, which is something we're investigating at the moment to try and find out where this comes from and if we can thereby also read out the state of these 2D antiferromagnets. So to sum this up, so um, the electrical readout is possible in insulators using spin hall magnetic resistance, in metals using anisotropic magnetic resistance and domain wall magnetic resistance. And for imaging, we can get readout by X-ray magnetic linear dichroism as a contrast mechanism. Uh, but there are also other mechanisms that I didn't introduce today, but that are quite important, such as a thermal spin Zeebeck imaging, um, anomalous Nernst effect, imaging uncompensated moment, second harmonic generation, magneto-optical curve effect, exchange bias, and so on. So there are a lot of ways to read out antiferromagnets, but it's important that we can do that electrically. So now let's get to the writing. Now let's first start with fields. I already showed you that uh, the susceptibility of antiferromines is small. That means if we apply a field, we get a canting of the two sublattices, which is very modest. So we have a canting of a few millirad or something like that. Um, however, what we can achieve is that if we orient the field in a different direction, the two sublattices will actually also rotate um, to actually align themselves perpendicular to the applied field, a so-called spin flop. And then we have the net moment due to the canting, which is parallel to the field, reducing the Zeeman energy. And in a very rare case where you have not very strong exchange coupling, but strong anisotropy, you might even get a spin flip, but we're not going to consider that. I just say that for completeness. Okay, so um, let's see if that really works, the spin flop. So actually here again is the example of our antiferromagnet. When if I apply a strong field, then we see that the um, sublattices orient perpendicular to the field. And if they are already perpendicular to the field, then they just can't a little bit in the applied field. And uh, we measured the extra immunetic linear dichroism process. So you see here the, the canting um, of the sublattices with the applied field. And so what we did is we measured the sublattices, uh, we measured the extra magnetic linear dichroism spectra for a sample which we oriented by a strong field. So it's mostly monodomain pointing in the nail vector pointing in one direction. And then we see that we have the spectrum where we get first a dip and then a peak. And then if you rotate the field by 90 degrees, we first get a peak and then a dip. So here we have actually rotated the nail vector due to this applied field, but usually that takes a lot of uh, field to do. So like in this case, maybe 60 Tesla. And that's difficult to implement in a CMOS device. Now, an alternative approach is to actually use strain. So strain can also induce anisotropies. And therefore, by um, applying a strain, we can orient the nail vector in a direction set by the anisotropy due to magnetoelastic coupling, which many of these antiferromagnets have. So this is the strain gauge, which looks a little bit like a medieval torture instrument. We can put the sample on it, torture it a bit, and then until it do it until it breaks. And before that, we actually see that for an unstrained sample with a multi-domain state, we see no net XMLD signal. And when we strain it and we generate a uniaxial anisotropy that aligns all the spins in the sublattices in one direction, we get this XMLD spectrum showing that these are aligned for just 0.1% elongation. Okay, now this is again not very practical for applications. So in application, you would like to have all electrical writing. So how can we do all electrical writing? So we see here that for ferromagnets it's very well established that this can be done by spin torque. We inject a spin polarized charge current into the ferromagnet. The spin polarized charge current then exerts a torque on the spins and thereby switches the magnetization by transfer of ang spin angular momentum. Now for an antiferromagnet, this uh, shouldn't work because we have spins which can interact with both sublattices. And this sublattice here would be rotating clockwise, whereas the next sublattice here should be rotating counterclockwise. And since we know that the antiferromagnetic coupling is extremely strong, we'll not be able to do that. So the question is, is there no net effect? One needs to think a little bit or talk to a smart theoretician like Helen Gomonai. 
Um, actually, it turns out that what you really need is you'd like to have a torque that is different acting on the two sublattices. And this really exists. This was first observed in copper manganese arsenide and then later in manganese to gold. And the reason is that these sublattices in manganese to gold and copper manganese arsenide are not equivalent. And you can see this nicely if you look at this manganese atom of the A site or the A sub lattice here, it sees above gold and below it sees four manganese B site. This manganese B site above sees four manganese A site and below gold. And these four manganese B sites see above one manganese A site and below gold. And these four manganese A sites see above gold and below a manganese B site. So every sub lattice actually knows which sublattice it is in by just looking at the environment. And so the torques acting on the two sublattices can be inequivalent because the sublattice are inequivalent. And so I'll just show you this famous uh, picture from uh, Jakob Zelezny, Frank Freimuth, Hiro, and Thomas, where you essentially would like to have coils wound around the two sublattices in opposite directions to exert torques in opposite directions. And then you expect that if you are able to do that, that the two sub lattices would actually reorient themselves in opposite directions. So you get a 90 degree switching of the two sub lattices. And as I said, this was first observed in copper manganese arsenide in the work by Pete Radley. And then we worked on that in manganese to gold, where we actually patterned the manganese to gold cross, where by injecting the current, it was predicted by Jakob Zelezny and Hyro and people that you can switch the magnetic sub lattices in a direction perpendicular to the injected current flow. So here in contrast to ferromagnets, we don't get 180 degree switching, but by flowing the current in 90 degree different directions, we get 90 de degree different orientations of the nail vector. And this actually works. So we did the experiment where in the experiment we patterned such a cross made of manganese to gold. And then when we inject current pulses, say along this direction here, the 1, 1 bar 0 direction, then the AMR or planar Hall effect goes down. And if we inject current along the 1, 1, 0 direction, we actually get an increase in the planar Hall effect. So we can get switching up and down by 90 degrees of the nail vector. Now, um, this is working for these very special antiferromagnets like copper manganese, arsenide, copper manganese, antimony, and also manganese to gold. But you'd rather like to have an effect that also works in systems that don't have this broken symmetry. And so for that, um, for instance, for nickel oxide, which is a very typical um, antiferromagnet, um, you'd like to have a torque that is exerted on the spins um, that works even in a system where we cannot distinguish between the sub lattices. And that was something that was predicted here by Helen Gomonai and Hiro Sinova, where if you put a bit of platinum below or above this antiferromagnet, then you see that the spins are actually um, injected across the interface into the antiferromagnet, leading to a domain wall motion in the antiferromagnet. This was also predicted here by uh, Kyung Jin Lee in this paper here. Um, and the thing is that this is quite nice because it leads to very fast domain wall motion. So it was predicted that uh, in this antiferromagnets, you don't have the problem of a Walker breakdown, which you get in ferromagnets, where, which limits your velocities to 100 meters per second. But actually, in antiferromagnet, the speed can be a few thousands of meters per second, limited just by the magnon maximum velocity in these systems. So this is very nice. So you're not limited by the Walker field, but you also have a problem because the domain wall motion direction is set by the chirality of the domain wall. So if you don't have a breaking a chiral exchange interaction, then some domain will move this way, some will move this that way, but you don't get net switching. However, there is a second effect, which was predicted by Helen, the so-called ponderomotive force in this paper here, where you actually get an, a 90 degree or reorientation of the nail vector due to the injected spins. And this 90 degree reorientation then gives you a net switching due to this ponderomotive force. So we set then out to see if this can be seen in this insulating antiferromagnets with some heavy metal on top. And for that, we patterned um, nickel oxide films with some platinum on top on MGO and injected current pulses along 90 degree different directions as seen here and here.
And then what do we expect? Well, possibly effects of this non-staggered spin orbit torques, damping like spin orbit torques, possibly dual heating and associated thermal strain, and possibly pure charge current effects in the platinum. And so this is what it looks like. It looks very messy. You have a lot of effects for small current densities as shown here. It's more or less flat. There is no effect. Then as we increase the current density, we get this switching which goes up and down. So which is like um, a step like switching. And then if you increase the current density even further, then suddenly the switching of the electrical signal reverses its polarity. And that's really weird because that means somehow the current density changes the direction of the switching. Is that realistic? We were not the only ones to see that. There are also these works here by Chang and Chen and Gray. They also saw similar effects. So we need to somehow sort out what part of this electrical signal that we, meet, that we read out corresponds to magnetic switching. What is the origin of the non-magnetic signal? And what is the origin of the magnetic signal? So let's first check what part of the electrical signal corresponds to magnetic switching. So this was done in this work here by uh, Felix Schreiber et al, where we started with a whole cross as shown here, and we inject a single current pulse and we see, ah, we can switch the current, we can switch the magnetization in this cross, um, the nail vector direction. And then we can inject the current pulse with 90 degree different direction and we see we switch it in 90 degree different direction. So firstly, we see, okay, there's direct imaging of the Niel order reorientation, meaning that indeed we can see that there's a 90 degree change of Niel order, so it's a magnetic switching. But the question is how much of this magnetic switching is also visible in the electrical signal? So for that, we need to do concurrent electrical measurements and magnetic imaging. And so what we do is we inject current pulses and we see that indeed we can switch the magnetization. And if we look at the switched area determined from imaging, we see after two, three pulses, this saturates, but the electrical signal continues to go up. Then we reverse the current pulse direction. We see again the electrical switching continuously goes down, whereas the magnetically, uh, magnetic switching that is detected by imaging saturates after two, three pulses, and again and again. So this means somehow it's qualitatively similar, but quantitatively not the same. So we see that after a few injections, the signal from the imaging saturates, but the electrical signal to continues to go up. And so we need to somehow subtract that. And we can do that. So first we see the electrical transport and the imaging show the same. But then after a few pulse injections, the electrical signal continues to go up, whereas the magnetic, uh, image, uh, magnetic switching detected from imaging saturates. And so we need to somehow subtract this additional electrical signal, which is not corresponding to magnetic switching. And we do this by having this linear fit here, which is phenomenological. And then we get very good agreement between the switching it detected by magnetic imaging and by electrical uh, detection. And to show that this really works, we did this for a lot of different current densities, where if we start with low current densities, we see only a tiny bit of switching. At intermediate current densities, we see like the center already has switched, and at high current density, virtually the whole all area inside the cross has switched. And then we did this for many, many current densities. And we see that um, we get more switching for higher current densities. And you see here, initially, there is little switching. And as we increase the current density, the amount that is switched continues to increase until the central area is fully black. And now we compare how much of this corrected electrical signal corresponds to how much of the uh, imaging detected magnetic switching, we get perfect linear fit between the, the, with a high correlation between the electrical signal and the magnetic signal. So this means there's robust electrical measurement of the area that is switched. And um, to show, however, um, that there is really a non-magnetic switching, um, we did an experiment in cobalt oxide where we can image easily above and below the nail temperature. So below the nail temperature, it looks a bit like uh, the nickel oxide. At low current densities, we get the step-like switching, and at high current density, this triangular switching. 
Whereas above the nail temperature, we only see this um, uh, non-magnetic uh, triangular switching, which allows us to identify that this has to do something with electromigration. We are not the only ones who find this. So in this work, which just came out last week, and here the other people also saw, even by imaging, that electromigration in the platinum can be of key importance. And so we know now the origin of this non-magnetic signal, which is electromigration effect. But the question is, what is the origin of the magnetic signal? And so to check if this has been orbit torques or it's also some colleagues suggested some magnetothermoelastic effect, we actually investigated different devices where we injected current pulses either flowing from left to right in a straight pulse or injecting the pulses across these 90 degree uh, corners, which in the center should give you the same current density, i.e. the same spin orbit torques. But as we can see from the heat and the strain, there's opposite strain. And we see that indeed the switching has the opposite sign. So we see here the switching of the um, nail vector is parallel to the current and here it's perpendicular to the current. And so this means already it cannot be spin orbit torques. But to unambiguously demonstrate this, we simply pattern now a disk in the center where there's no platinum around it. So the current is flowing only around this disk. So there's no current flowing here in the center. And let's see, we can actually still switch the center. So this means the disk here in the center has, has not seen any current flow, but is still switching, which means it cannot be spin orbit torques. And so this is likely then a thermomagnetoelastic switching mechanism as we have analyzed in this paper, which is also on archive. So the conclusions of this part here, which is kind of the new, is that the magnetic switching is in, induced by current pulses that can be revealed by direct magnetic imaging. So there is magnetic switching. Transport data can detect this magnetic switching if you appropriately subtract this electrical effects. There are additional electrical uh, effects due to electromigration. And the origin of the magnetic switching in the thick samples at least is thermomagnetoelastic. And there are possibly also spin orbit torque effects primarily in the thinner samples. And so to sum this up, so we can write by spin flop we can write by strain, but most interestingly, we can write by currents due to spin orbit torques, either bulk or interfacial and thermomagnetoelastic switching. And the nice thing about thermomagnetoelastic is that it's non-contact. We actually don't need the current to flow through your device. So you can do this with a laser. You can do this by non-local heating. So there are a lot of possibilities that might be due to this non-local um, possibility of the thermomagnetoelastic switching. Okay, and uh, now we have the writing and the reading and you can make a real device. So this is a slide from Thomas Jungwirth, who actually made such a device here, wire bonded onto a chip, which you can plug into your USB port. And then you have your one bit antiferromagnetic memory. Not very impressive, but what is impressive that it works up to 12 Tesla and down to 250 picoseconds. So this really is a device that cannot be disturbed by the fields you can easily generate. And now in the last five minutes, let me just give you a few updates on uh, spin transport and antiferromagnets. So um, if you have an antiferromagnet and you'd like to transport spin, the typical geometry that you're using is a so-called non-local spin valve. So in such a non-local spin valve, we have our spin conduit, which in our case is an antiferromagnetic insulator. We have two lines here, which are platinum, which is used as a spin injector due to the spin hall effect and the spin detector due to the inverse spin hall effect. And this was pioneered for ferromagnets by Bart van Wees in this paper by uh, Ludo Cornelissen. Um, and then this was extended to antiferromagnets. And so what we have chosen as an antiferromagnet is hematite, which is an easy access antiferromagnet below the Morin transition and an easy plane weak ferromagnet above the Morin transition. And we investigate different C plane and R plane surfaces and put our, um, put our uh, platinum strips on top of these surfaces. So the first thing we found in this paper two years ago that stirred a bit of interest was that actually the distance dependence of our transport signal shows that we can get transport over long distance, over micron distances. And this was novel at the time because so far people had seen, <coughs> had seen only transport over the distance of a few nanometers. So here we're talking about 40 microns of transport distance. Um, secondly, um, 
we found that there is an exponential decay, meaning that the transport in our case is diffusive because we have no threshold current density. It can work at elevated temperatures and there is this exponential decay. And the key home take home message was that you need to measure for relatively long distances in order to see this exponential decay. Now, what we did more recently is we compared the exponential decay for the same hematite, but for different planes, C plane or R plane. And then we found that interestingly, even though it's the same material, if we look at different planes, the distance over which we can transport spin varies quite a bit. So here over uh, C plane, uh, we get a distance of about 400 nanometers. For R plane thin films, we get a distance of about 600 nanometers. And if we go close to the spin orientation transition, then we see that actually the uh, spin transport length scale is not even dominated anymore by diffusive transport, but we see this very short length scale of just 100 nanometers or so where the spin signal decays. So there's not simple diffusion at the spin flop. And the question is why? And so to check that, we did some imaging and we found that in the C plane where we see very short um, uh, spin transport, we see very small domains or in the equivalent case, we see very small domains uh, with uh, many domain walls. In this R plane where we see uh, transport length scale of the order of a few hundred nanometers, we also have domain sizes of a few hundred nanometers. And in the bulk, we have domain sizes which are tens of microns and we see also micron sized spin transport length scales and also nickel oxide, we see very short small domains and also very short spin transport length scales. So there was a theory that predicted that uh, circularly polarized magnons should be scattered from domain walls. And if you have many domain walls, you have a lot of scattering. So you get magnon domain wall resistance. This was predicted in this paper by the group of Arne Bratas. And so this can explain our results, meaning that the domain size can govern the spin transport length scale in these domain walls. And then let me show you some recent results as the final two slides that actually by doping, we can change the Morin transition. For instance, here we can switch the Morin transition from below room temperature to above room temperature to get transport in the easy access phase at room temperature, or we can even transport spin in the easy plane phase at room temperature, which was also shown here by our colleagues in this Nature Nanotechnology paper, which came out in our paper here as well. So even in the easy plane, there's a possibility due to the superposition of linear polarized spin waves to have a net spin transport. And finally, also uh, just one word on special spin structures. So here is an anti-ferromagnetic anti, anti -skerm. And if you're interested, we now put the paper on archive in this version two, where you see also the spin structure and explanation what it looks like because anti-ferromagnetic skirmions are potentially very interesting. This has a topology of an anti-ferromagnetic anti, anti -skermion. What stabilizes is, is something that we still need to find out. Okay, so to sum this up, for the transport, so there's a lot of work on diffusive versus superfluid spin transport with claims in both directions. We think that we've seen so far only diffusive transport. So we've seen that domains and domain walls influence the spin transport. And there are a lot of studies on spin transport in spin in structures where the transport is vertically across the antiferromagnet and not uh, in a non-local geometry. And there's also some interesting work on magnon spin valves. Now, the most important slide, because obviously I didn't do the work, so this is all the people that did the work. In particular, much of the work on the antiferromagnets was supervised by two great postdocs, Romain Lebrun and Lorenzo Baldrati. Lorenzo on the switching, Romain more on the transport. And then many students have been involved in the work um, that has been done in the group. And in particular, of, of course, I'd like to thank my permanent staff scientists, Martin Jordan, Gerhard Jakob. Martin has been pushing most of the manganese to gold work. Gerhard has been involved with much of the oxide work. Hartmut Zabel is our visiting professor, and of course, many former group members that have meanwhile gone on to do greater things somewhere else. And we've had great collaborations and also had some input from slides from people in mind. So Helen, Karen, and Jairo, Florian Kronas at Bessie. Then I have a good collaboration at NTNU where I'm an adjunct professor with the group of Anna Bratas, Alirisa Kayumzade, and now also uh, Akash Kamra, with, with which we are writing a paper in Utrecht with a group of Rembert Dönen, in particular Scott Bender and Camilo Oloa. 
and uh, at uh, Tuhoku and now in other places, Oleg Tretyakov, Rafael Ramos, Ichi Saito, Gerrit Bauer, and Joe Barker is now in Leeds. And nothing would work without the people at the beam lines like Markus Weigand and Hermann Stoll, Uli Novak with some theory. And I got input for slides from Vasa Balz, Taku Moriyama, Teru Uno from Kyoto, and uh, with Tobias Kampfrath from Berlin. Nothing would work without funding, in particular the IEEE Magnetic Society that is sponsoring the Distinguished Lecturer talk, even though this is a very good value talk. And so the sum it up. So we can record, we can read antiferromagnets by direct imaging using XMLD and Kerr microscopy and electrically by spin homing resistance and AMR. We can write antiferromagnets and, and insulators and metals by spin orbit torques and strain. And we can transport spin information antiferromagnets over long distances depending on the spin structure. And if you are new to the topic, I can recommend these good review articles down here. There's a whole series in Nature Physics and the recent one in Review of Modern Physics um, that give you more insights as an introduction. Yes, and with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. We all thank you and everybody with the hands up. I think thanks to you as well. Um, so now uh, we're going to move on to a few of the questions then. Um, let me uh, allow uh, the first question come from uh, uh, Pinaki Singupta. Uh, let me, uh, allow, sorry, uh, allow you to talk. So go ahead, uh, Pinaki, uh, ask you two questions that you have. I think also commented by Daniel as well. Yeah, thank you, Matthews, for an excellent talk. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that a, the uh, polarization field is of the order of 1,000 Teslas for antiferromagnets. Mm -hmm. Is it for 3D antiferromagnets? Is it for in-plane antiferromagnets? Because for many antiferromagnets, you can have polarized, complete polarization at reasonable fields. And just to follow up, uh, a second question is, uh, what about the microscopic interactions uh, that are involved in, uh, uh, that are necessary for observing the phenomena that you described? Uh, do you have dominant uh, Heisenberg and then do you also have DM interactions or any single ion and isotropy, et cetera? Okay, so firstly, for the energy scales, I mean, yeah. uh, okay, so the 1000 Tesla is to bring the two subletters from anti-parallel to parallel alignment. So this uh, sets essentially the transfer susceptibility. Of course, it depends on the materials, but let's say for the ones that we are using, that's of that uh -huh. order. Okay, yeah? okay. So okay. of course, for instance, it's known that in these layered like antiferromagnets like the chromium trichloride, there this is a mm -hmm. small. Yeah, so okay. their, their field is not as large, but like in this typical, um, you know, manganese to gold or something like that, that's of that order of magnitude. So that's simply, you know, and whether it's 500 or 5,000 doesn't matter. It's just yeah, much larger I, anything we can do. Definitely. Um, so the second question was concerning anisotropies. Yeah, anisotropy or, or what about the microscopic interactions that drive these phenomena uh, that... Yeah, so um, right. yes, I mean, so, so for instance, um, if you look at, uh, you know, what drives these phenomena here, so the antiferromagnetic inter sublattice exchange drives this, mm -hmm. the intra sublattice exchange drives the nail temperature, gives the nail temperature, and the anisotropy drives the spin flop together with the exchange field. Now, the type of um, anisotropy that you have depends very much on the system. So in nickel oxide, sure. uh, we have this, uh, you know, easy plane system and hematite, we have an easy axis below the Morin transition and due to a jaloshinsky moria interaction, something I didn't mention here. So in antiferromagnets, you can have jaloshinsky moria interaction. But what is very important also to, you know, tell the community is that in an antiferromagnet, what DMI does, it cans the two sap lattices to generate a weak magnetic moment. It doesn't lead right. to spiralization, the typical uh, inter sap lattice DMI. If you want to have spiralization to have this antiferromagnetic antiskermions, then you need the so-called Lifshitz invariants, or some people call it inhomogeneous and homogeneous DMI. But you have to be very careful that if the DMI is between the subletters, it just cans the moments a little bit, generating mm -hmm. a weak moment. But then if you want to have spir spiralization, you need this Lifshitz invariant. And that's something that, you know, people are interested. We are looking at in, into that as well, how you can um, uh, get the DMI, how you can, uh, you know, vary the DMI. Um, but it's a, it's a materials property that you might be able to tune by things, yes. 
Thanks a lot. Um, okay, the next uh, questions I think can be answered by the, uh, maybe the uh, Dr. Sam, uh, Samat, Samathan, okay, you can maybe speak now. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so thank you. Hi, Clay. Uh, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, recently, we are aware of uh, a fully compensated ferry magnets, which mm -hmm. are also useful for spintronics. So, I have a small uh, doubt how do we clearly distinguish? Antiferromagnets from fully compensated ferromagnets, and to follow up, how does antiferromagnets are advantages than fully compensated ferromagnets in spintronics? Yes. Thank you. So that's a very valid point. So there's a big difference. So for instance, typical ferromagnets like garnets or you know like um, a gadolinium ion or something, the big difference is that the two sublattices are different materials. So gadolinium ion at the compensation point just has the same moment for gadolinium as iron, but the two sublattices are not identical. So that makes, makes it, it different. However, if you look, for instance, at the magnum spectrum, you can, at the compensation point, get similar magnum spectra as you have for, um, as you have for, uh, for antiferromagnets. Um, so uh, for applications, the big difference is that, of course, the antiferromagnets stay antiferromagnet with a broad temperature range, whereas the ferry magnets, as soon as you go away from the compensation temperature, they become ferry magnetic. And that means, for instance, if you do this current induced experiments, it's extremely difficult to stay at the compensation temperature. It can actually be used for the, some, some ideas of magnetic optical memory, where you are compensated at room temperature and then you heat with a laser to go to an uncompensated state and then switch it. But fundamentally, there is a difference in that ferry magnets have usually different atom species for the two sublattices, whereas antiferromagnets, for instance, in our case, don't. Generally, uh, the fully compensated ferry magnets, uh, the Husserl LOS, we are recently actually observing uh, that phenomena. But uh, uh, can we see something like that? I mean, some, something like antiferromagnetic spintronics in, from arising from Husserl LOS? I mean, they are, of course, antiferromagnetic Husslers, absolutely. The antiferromagnetic Häusler compounds, um, and they're also ferrimagnetic Häusler compounds. You know, there's the material class a priori for what, for the basics that I've talked to you about doesn't matter, whether it's an oxide or whether it's an intermetallic compound or some Häusler intermetallic. I mean, that absolutely is not, you know, uh, there's nothing, you know, Häuslers are very flexible. So there's a lot of exciting science in Häuslers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, let's move on to Gisela. You have some questions? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. A little bit low, but so maybe you can speak yeah, up. I always the same questions. How realistic are these for applications? So the, these normally single crystals are very, very hard to get. And these extremely high current densities, no CMOS device can stand. Is there a way to solve or to meet this challenge? Yeah. I mean, yes, this is, of course, you know, uh, it's always a difficult question. You know, I used to work with IBM. <laughs> I was, uh, as a postdoc uh, at IBM Zurich Labs. Um, and uh, I worked uh, on the racetrack. And, uh, you know, this is a great idea. And I was absolutely convinced uh, that by now it would be on the market, but it's not. So obviously, I was not a very good, uh, you know, my, my glass uh, uh, ball is broken. Um, so I think it's very difficult. So what I learned at IBM is that essentially often the, um, the uh, um, decisive factor is not the technology, but if there is a need for the device. So the question is, do we need a memory that is highly resilient to external fields like 12 Tesla or 15 Tesla or whatever? If there is a need for that, and it has to be you know, non-volatile magnetic for its for temperature stability, then you know, I think industry will find a way to make it. But you know, if um, there is a memory that is cheaper and uh, can do the same trick, then industry will go for that if it's more easily CMOS compatible. So I think that uh, fundamentally, if the effect is there um, and industry re really wants, they could also get the current densities to go down sufficiently. I mean, for spin transfer torque, you have the memory in the market. It's a niche market, but it's still there. And industry got it to work. 
So I think there's no fundamental showstopper. But uh, what we need is we need to have a market where people are actually willing to pay money for these type of devices. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, Ali Reza, go ahead and yeah. ask a question. Hello, Matthias. Hi, hi, Reza. Hi. Just a, a comment or maybe a question uh, about this. Uh, Len, uh, about this energy scales here, uh, at least from uh, uh, molecular field theory, I know that uh, this nail temperature is uh, depend of nearest neighbors as well. Then uh, I'm a little bit surprised that you could distinguish yes. between nearest yeah, neighbor yeah. and next nearest neighbor because yeah. at least uh, if it's uh, from microscopic calculation, we can show that nail temperature depend of the nearest neighbors coupling, which is yes. a ferromagnetic. Yeah, actually, I had exactly that discussion with Helen. So I'd just like to ask Helen to tell the world what she has told me, because we're just exactly discussing that. Yeah, I, I think there was a comment going on between Helen and, and Danielle, which is also from the panelists. So go ahead and Helen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and comment on yeah. that. Uh, I, I think that I made myself quite clear when I just mentioned that uh, in the, my first comment uh, that as a general statement uh, that uh, uh, this nail temperature uh, is determined by intra-sublattice interaction in general is not true because uh, it may be true for frustrated systems. As I made this remark that if it's not frustrated, then it's not true. It's simply nearest neighbor inter-sublattice coupling. That's what determines uh, nail temperature and sublimitization. Yeah. Maybe in a particular system you consider like nickel oxide mm. uh, that's more tricky, but it's frustrated. Uh, it's uh, FCC. So as a general statement, that's simply not true. Mm. Oh. I would say that uh, there is um, we should uh, um, understand that uh, there is a phenomenological approach and microscopic approach and from the no, point no, no, of view of microscopic uh, phenological approach. Uh, phenomenological approach uh, uh, should not really uh, Contradict the general physics. It does not. It does not contradict the general physics. And in uh, macroscopic approach, what we do, we average over the uh, large macroscopic volumes. Uh, this physically small, but macroscopic volumes. And when we do this averaging, we uh, take into account all the um, microscopic exchange. And uh, when I introduce these parameters like intra uh, sublattice exchange and uh, <clears throat> inter sublattice exchange, uh, both constants uh, include contribution from all uh, kinds of microscopic exchange which we can find in the system. But for uh, our um, applications, phenomenological models, it's much more convenient to distinguish between intra, which is important only in the vicinity of the nail uh, temperature, and um, inter sublattice exchange, which is responsible for the dynamics, for correlations in magnon spectra, and so on. Uh, I absolutely agree with your uh, concept, but I think it's simply two points of view from macroscopic and microscopic. That's all. Well, no, I simply don't understand it, because suppose I take, for example, simple uh, system like cubic perovskites, then I can include only inter sublattice exchange only nearest neighbor inter sublattice exchange, and that's enough. I, uh, I don't uh, have to worry about uh, further nearest uh, in, uh, yeah, coupling. Yes, and yes, that yes. will give me uh, everything uh, I need. Okay, it it will give me magnetization, it will give me nail temperature, it will give me susceptibility, it will give me spin wave spectrum, and, uh, and so on. Right. If we I have more complicated system, like frustrated, then know. maybe you have to worry about all this. Hey, Otherwise, I don't think there is a problem here. Like it, I don't think there is inherently a problem. Uh, Daniel, you're always you're thinking as you as you rightly say, uh, in a tie binding microscopic model, uh, calculating these things from the microscopic essentially a spin uh, like this type of system, uh, which is not contradictory to what Helen is saying. Helen is saying she never thinks of lattices. You know, there's not really a lattice anymore. She thinks of the symmetries allowed. And then the, the, probably the, the nomenclature that she uses of calling it intra versus inter is unfortunate, uh, but it's connected to the symmetry, to the irreducible representations <laughs> that she chooses to describe her magnetic and the magnetic system. That's all. Uh, in, so in that sense, the physics cannot be different. It's just as he also rightly mentioned, different points of view. One is a phenomenological one, which is macroscopic inherently, 
-hmm. and yours, which is also correct, uh, which is going more to the micro microscopic origin of looking at the particular microscopic exchanges calculated from our initial, et cetera, which also are correct. You know, this is, that's all. That's, I think that's more of a, um, uh, sometimes a mixture of, uh, of approaches that we have to be aware of. Um, at least this is what I was understanding from Helen and from discussing with Helen, from discussing with Bertrand yeah. Dupay, which yeah. also we look at it from the microscopic point of view, like you do, Daniel. Um, no. and I mean, I, th no. I, th I think it's uh, important that one, that one gets it again, correct. If it's, if but, it's more complicated system, like, say, for example, FCC, like nickel oxide, then maybe that would make some sense. But, uh, for example, uh, if I would try to uh, use the same uh, approach for simple uh, bipartite antiferromagnet, I don't think there should be this difference. Okay. I mean, for the sake of this talk, both numbers, 1,000 and 100 Tesla, are simply way above anything that we can get to experimentally. So Yeah, yeah but you are dealing with prostrated material. That's the point. That you are dealing with material which is FCC lattice, which mm -hmm. is prostrated. And then in this case, you have many different uh, magnetic states which are very close in energy, and that will be already weaker coupling exchange, uh, maybe a further neighbor exchange, which will determine which particular uh, regime, which particular state you are in. But mm -hmm. it wouldn't apply to simple square lattice like perovskite. Okay. No, I mean, I agree, I agree. So, so I will, I'll update this to make this a little more precise. Okay, now, okay, now that's actually a good idea. Uh, so with this, um, I would like to, uh, because it's not more, we're going to remain here and make some